I can't keep as a chairman. Uh, it is indeed a uh, I will go a step further and say I don't have to be a member of a particular church or marry into a particular family to be somebody. This is my country. And people must be promoted on the basis of merits. There's nobody's farm. It's not your farm. It's your country. It's mine. You cannot claim any special right to the soil because your father was from Morovia, grew up. Your symbols, a young brother, a young brother said to you, look at your symbols. Look at your symbols. We've been saying it for years. Your years. You don't want to meet in the national support, especially from our so-called upper class. They have come to Ghana, Nigeria. They've gone to Sierra and Guinea. I said they now realize that civilized, so-called civilized, educated women from the upper class wear African costume. They feel proud. I say in my country, they thought when the market women wore, wore these things. Before they stopped, they went to the national functions, burning heat, gloves, bowler hat, coat. These people, I said to him, these people never thought they were African people. They never thought they were African people. That is your history. So examine your history. See the crisis that you develop. And your tragedy is that your fathers and forefathers, most of them, were not courageous enough to confront the problems. So they threw the problems on the lap of their children. And their children inherited the problems, like Tobit and others, who inherited the problems. But whether I can tell you something, do or no do, moja or no moja, pal or no pal, PPP. The way this society is organized or was organized, it was just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. That's when we came in. Thank you. Now, against the backdrop of uh, what has been said, and I have reference to, uh, to what you referred to earlier, but Herman Cohen, former assistant secretary of state against the background of what he said during the TRC hearings in the US would you opine that the involvement of Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire in the Liberian crisis somehow received the tacit approbation of the US let me say you know the late Ahmed Sekoutoure had said to us A.B. Tarba had been killed together with Vanny Sherman after the execution of uh, Thomas West End. I had taken over the foreign ministry after Barker's marches. And Samuel Doe sent Podia and myself to Guinea to go and explain to Secretary that the late we're saying had killed A.B. Talbot. Our delegation got to Guinea and they took us to the Palace de Perp. Of course, I'm a secretary, widely read, he understood so much. The first thing he brought up, he said, I noticed that your students are agitated. And the late podium said, the students are troublemakers. I'm a secretary, said no. When you took power, the students were rejoicing. If today they have turned against you, it's, posi- it's because you have changed. Students don't change. Not until they leave college. You have to examine yourself. Bodia then said, Head of State Doe wants me to tell you that the list was sent, the Vice Head of State, executed A.B. Talbot. Uh, 
Secretary said to him, Secretary said, Hufe is not a man who forgives easily. He said when A.B. Tower was arrested from the French embassy and put in prison, Hufe Boini sent to me to ask me to intercede with Doe to free A.B. Tower. Secretary said, I sent my Prime Minister, Lassana Biogogi, to Do. Do said to me, there was no problem. Ebito was all right. He will, go, he will go to try. A couple of months later, the news got to French intelligence that Ebito had been executed. French intelligence then informed President Hufe Boigny. Hufe, Hufe Boigny again sent to President Touré. He said, I've learned that A.B. Talbot has been killed. Secretary said, I send Biavogi again to head of state Do. Head of state Do said, it was not true. Now you have come to me to tell me to tell President Hufe Boini that A.B. Talbot was killed by the late Wesen. And Secretary said, Wesen is dead. He cannot defend himself. But I can tell you one thing. We all have to die and answer to our maker. But Hufe Boini, knowing him as I do, he will not forgive you. And so, yes, when Hufe realized that there was a group willing to overthrow Samuel Doe, and it was stated, it was stated at the hate trial by one of the leading members of the NPFL, that they were giving arms. Why waiting for Libyan arms? They were giving arms by the Ivorian Defense Ministry. Of course, Hufe Boigny knew. And because of Hufe Boigny's connection in Paris, it is possible that he convinced the French. The French were heavily involved. He convinced the French that Taylor should be helped. We have information from our sources that the son of the President of France of, 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 of President Mitterrand was in con con contact with the Taylor people. So obviously Burkina Faso, Blaise Campori will only be courageous to send 700 to 1,000 soldiers into Liberia if he had the tacit endorsement of the French to Hufe Boigny. Yes, now it's just possible that the French, knowing that they were going to support Mr. Taylor, Knowing the connection of Hufe Boini to Mr. Taylor and his group, and also Blaise Campari, it is just possible, it is just possible that they could have sent the signals to the Americans that uh, we can handle this. We can handle this. And that was the problem the Nigerians had. Because the Nigerians had the potential, they had the capacity to destroy the NPFL. They were stopped at every step of the way. And they kept saying to themselves, what is happening about Liberia? Why do we find it so difficult to get a consensus, a consensus to move in with full force and stop this war? Arms were coming through the Ivory Coast. So if you like, at a particular stage, because of the involvement of Hufi Boini, because of other international actors, this whole internal rebellion became a vast international conspiracy to help the Taylor people to stop searching other forces who are perceived to be anti-whatever. So yes, I think and I, I must appreciate what Mr. Cohen said to you people in America. He knows, he has seen the records, but we can only conjecture that there was a desire by certain international actors to ensure that Mr. Taylor took power in Liberia, irrespective of the fact that he was coming from Libya which was a barrier state, with all his values antithetical to the values of certain international partners, or actors. So yes, I believe that sincerely. And so obviously, at the end, Mr. Taylor was given the presidency. But like all historical mirages, Mr. Taylor ended the way he did. He ended the way he did. Because this society is complex. It's complex. To rule a society, you have to understand the actors, the various forces. Why was it possible after a few years? Learn 
model, all these people popping up. You cannot take power through guns and then intend to suppress people when they have already taken guns before. This crisis, yeah. This crisis in Liberia was the crisis of leadership. 1997, the Americans, the French, the entire international community. To the instrumentality of Yufa Boni and his people, even the Nigerians have conceded to Taylor that you are president of Liberia. You are president of Liberia. We deal with you. So why all this aggression? Why all these movements into other countries? What are you trying to prove? What are you trying to prove? So that was the tragedy. The tragedy was, as Mandela said recently, it's a want of leadership. You have been given power. Develop your country. Your opponents are in exile. And you are making you are making the joke to your supporters. When I leave from here, some of them will come walking with sticks. They will be so old. Vision 2021. The man didn't have vision for 20, uh, 2001. He talking about 2024. But this was the reality. So it was a, it was a, a, a serious tragedy of leadership. And that's where we got to where we were. With more wars. With more wars. So yes, Mr. Stewart. The Ivorian Shiva Boni is dead. But of course, we paid close attention to the tribe because we ourselves did not know certain things until we started following the tribe. And now the puzzle, the puzzle, is all coming into place. It's all coming into place. Our arrest, the killing of our militants, the killing of Liberians, all these talks in Washington. Socialism, communist, socialism, communist. Only to make way for a tailor. But like they say, history poses no problem for which there is no solution. Now, against this backdrop, would you agree with those who hold the view that Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, even the U.S., in a way, should pay reparations to Liberia for the kind of havoc that was wreaked by someone would describe as the marionette? You see, you see my brother, uh, Commission Stewart, men who rule country, or women who rule country, will have to realize that politics is not a Sunday school party. The Americans have their interests to protect. They will protect their interests. It's possible they saw Taylor as having momentum. The Ivorians felt that Mr. Doe was anathema. He had killed A.B. Tobba. The old man was aggrieved. Blaise Campori had to do the bearings of the old man. So these countries obviously gave support to Charles Taylor. All nations must realize, as they say, the fundamentals of international politics. There are no permanent friends, only permanent interests. What the date? The date against the background of the perception that Mr. Taylor would probably be better for the interests. Now, if you talk about these countries being reparation, I gave you a good example. Most people do not know that the Americans are spending over $250 million every year to keep the armed forces here. Yeah. To keep the armed forces. The budget of armed in Liberia is close to $800 million. The Americans are paying over, over $250 million. I think that's reparation enough. Now, it's possible some people say, pay more. But you see, big nations have the interests. You must understand how you engage them. And that is why the leader must be a strategist. You must identify where there are ideas or interests of convergence. If you ask America to pay, and America say we're not paying, are you going to invade New York or Washington? Blaise Campari, Blaise Campari, Blaise Campari. I've never been to Burkina Faso. I was a great admirer of Thomas Sankara. 
and I always remember his famous quotation. A soldier without political education is a potential bandit. That was Sankara. I've never been to Mr. Kampari's country, and I hope I never go there while he's there. Kampari has been identified by the United Nations as a, as a seller of arms to UNITA in Angola, as a trafficker in diamonds, as one of the men, the one of the men who fomented this civilization in West Africa. Have you heard anybody talk about Kampari going to war crimes or so? That is the nature of international politics. Mr. Kampari has big backers, huge backers with nuclear weapons. Kampari is going nowhere. That is what our chancellor did not realize. This Kampari has been this, the epic center of all destabilization movements in West Africa, in East Africa. Nobody has taken him. Nobody will take him. They were even organizing ECOWAS meeting in Ouagadougou. No, it's different. You can't force them to pay reparation. La Côte d'Ivoire, they have their own crisis. They will tell you that was Shufi Boni, that's not us. You want to name and shame them? Do so. But what, what would it benefit you are you going to now sell the blood of your people who have died? The over 250,000, you going to pay, ask for payment for the blood? To ask for payment for the blood? That they were instrumental in promoting wars? No. What we do is that we strengthen our country, educate our citizens, so that tomorrow, no army, no old man because of his relationship with people can invade our country, even when on may leaves. It's our responsibility. I think to go groveling before these people, begging them, pay us reparation. Liberia is destroyed. So, other nations have been destroyed through wars. Angola, 30 years of wars. Other people have fought wars. Nicaragua, Vietnam. They are building their own country. The worst thing you can do to the the memory of those who die is to say to those who were responsible, the ex external actors, pay us for the death of our people. You don't do that. Instead, what we do, we establish a massive monument and select a day in our history where every day we go and remind our children and their children that men died because of so-and-so reasons and we must make sure that this will never happen again. That's what we can do. Let us not be beggars to those who laugh that because we were weak on the develop that they could do what they wanted to do to our country. Our duty and your duty as young men and women is to ensure that your leaders strengthen your country, empower you as young people, not to be afraid, but to be able to defend yourselves at any time. So tomorrow, these borders will not be porous. If you don't do that, and you go to Mr. Kampori, you go to the Iborians, you go to the Americans, what they will conclude is that these poor black people are now selling blood for money. It's, it's not blood diamonds, it's blood for money. The people have died, they are begging for money. We got gold, we got diamond, we got rubber, we got timber, we got iron ore, we got marine resources. People say we are rich. It is not reflected in the welfare of our people. We must be bold enough to say, we will seize our resources and deposit them in the laps of our people. Our partners can walk along with us. And so the message we send to those is that when we strengthen ourselves and mobilize our people, if you dare come again, you'll find a united people, angry and determined that there will not be a repetition of this history. That's all. Thank you. Now, uh, as a prominent politician and a political scientist, how do you reckon the, I'm talking about the Liberian situation, how do you think uh, the politics of the Cold War impacts regional decision making vis-a-vis -vis the resolution of the Liberian crisis? 
Well, you see, I think it was very easy. Now, after the Cold War, it was obvious that nobody could play the card. Nobody could play the communist card. So people like the late Rufe Boini and his partners in West Africa decided that, of course, they will support whoever they wanted to support. But when the Nigerians came in with ECOM, the whole Liberian peacekeeping took another dimension. Because under President Babaginda, the Nigerians were determined that the Nigerian army will not be humiliated in Liberia. They were determined. But they realized one thing, that if major powers were supporting Charles Taylor, there could only be one reason, and that was to humiliate the Nigerian army to such an extent that it would go back home, implode, and there would be a change. Because you know, the Western powers had an example. It happened in Argentina. The military had taken power in Argentina. A very repressive military regime. And when the Western powers wanted to destroy the Argentinian army, its legitimacy, it simply went into the Faulkners. When they got into the Faulkner Island, they were beaten back. When they went back home, the people said, this is an army that cannot even defend our sovereignty. So, what legitimacy do you have to rule? The army had to go back to the barracks. The Nigerians were always aware of the Argent Argentine example, that if they were not careful in Liberia, they would be shamed into withdrawing, and Mr. Taylor would crown his victory with the defeat of Nigeria, which would then have to deal with the problem of Nigerian citizens demanding a civilian rule. And I'm saying here, what obtained here was that the, the French, and I say, I make bold to say, the French have always been suspicious of the Nigerians in West Africa. Because for them, they felt that the Nigerians had this policy of Pac, Pac Nigeriana, like the Americans have theirs of Pac Americana, or Pac Britannia that the Nigerians had this whole thing of a pack Nigerian, Nigeriana. The Nigerians were also very wary of the French because France was the only major country that supported the buyer France in the struggle for secession. The French was the only, France was the only country. So the Nigerians were very hesitant that with the French involvement to Hufi Boini, they had to be very careful because France would never allow the defeat of a group supported by Hufi Boni in Liberia. And it's possible, it's possible, it's just possible that Abacha got the signal and decided that Nigeria should cut its losses and leave with power given to Mr. Taylor. Yes, the regional configuration of power at that time favored Hufi Boni because he had serious backing, serious backing. And he exploited that. You can't blame him. You can't even blame Mr. Taylor. And the whole idea of the Cold War at its end, at its end, if you were to bring up the question of communism, the Americans felt that this system was dying. Any African who toyed with this system was crazy. And I still believe, I still believe, in my heart's heart, that one reason why the Americans probably abandoned Samuel Doe was when he started dealing with Nikola Shashesko of Romania. The Americans felt that this was the end of the Cold War. The Soviet system was imploring. From within, it was being destroyed. Shashesko was the last remaining Stalinist communist. And he was moving around to solidify his position. It was the time that Samuel Doe brought him here, gave him a doctorate degree, brought in tanks from this man. And for the Americans, Mr. Dodi understand the nature of the international struggle. And so, yes, those who promoted Mr. Taylor and helped him had a conjunction. The whole idea of the regional grouping of power under Hufi Boini, and also the fear of certain international actors that no, no pro-communist or pro-Russian or sympathizer of any communist will imagine in a West African country. This was the age of the American century. I think that's what Mr. Cohen was trying to say. This was the age of the American century. And so therefore, Mr. Doe fell victim to forces he did not understand that he, he could never comprehend. 
Ditto for Mr. Taylor. With the fall of communism, there was no more. He tried several times to pin this, this exile as communist sympathizers. But he failed to realize with the, with the end of the Cold War, another boogeyman had emerged, and that was so-called Islamic fundamentalism, which the Americans realized. And poor Mr. Taylor, out for business, probably decided to deal with elements who came looking for diamond without him realizing that these people were members of Al-Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. And so therefore the Americans felt that, but there's a dangerous young man. We gave you power. We allow you to rule. We've been interacting with you. And you bring Al-Qaeda to Liberia. These were the people who blew up, who blew up the, the Twin Towers in America. And at the, at the Hague, some of the people said, yes, we knew them. We saw them. These are pictures the FBI put out. These are the people Mr. Taylor was dealing with. For the Americans, that was unforgivable. Like though, like Taylor, was strange. Now, as a follow-up, given what you said, what would you say were the perspectives of other players in the sub-region like 